With just 52 days until the midterms, the GOP is racking up a long list of political stunts that one might call, hmm, desperate? Much has been made this past week about Governors Abbott and DeSantis' sending migrants to liberal cities, as they call them, on the taxpayer's dime. But at this point, should we even be surprised by GOP stunts like these? Back in April, DeSantis revoked Disney's self-governing status when the theme park made a statement opposing his Don't Say Gay bill. That same month, Abbott added mandatory new inspections for all trucks coming in from Mexico, apparently to catch drug smugglers and human traffickers. None were caught and traffic was delayed for days. Republican legislators in at least 21 states have tried to enact bans on critical race theory in public schools, something that's not even taught there in the first place. Don't forget the multiple attempts as well to ban books with race and LGBTQ plus themes. And consider this one. One GOP lawmaker even suggested a book burning. In the middle of all of this noise, the Democrats are hard at work getting things done and tackling the issues. Passing the Inflation Reduction Act, also tackling climate change, investing in American manufacturing with the CHIPS Act, and expanding health care for veterans with the PACT Act plus historic bipartisan gun legislation. Joining me now to talk about how all of this is going to affect the midterms is Democratic Congressman from Tennessee, Steve Cohen. Congressman, good morning. Always nice to have you here. Wanted to start with this, a Politico op-ed noted this week. DeSantis would gladly set himself on fire, jump off a tall building, drive a Shelby Mustang off a cliff, ride a barrel over a waterfall, fly a wingsuit through a narrow mountain gap, or dance the yo-yo pole like the stuntmen in Mad Max if he senses even a smidgen of political gain in return. Congressman, is this kind of political theater that I think is just standard operating procedure for the GOP at this point really going to help them come November? Well, I don't know if it'll help, but I suspect it might help them with their base for sure. And that's part of getting the nomination. Uh, I was served on Judiciary Committee with Ron DeSantis. I think it was about six years. I'm not sure how, how long he was in the House, because until he decided he wanted to be governor and uh, worship Donald Trump to get his support, I never knew who he was. And all of a sudden, he started talking up in committee. And I had to turn to some of my colleagues and say, you know, who is that guy? Who is that masked man? And they said, well, he's running for governor. And he, he went from just kind of a... a, a this guy that sat there and didn't really contribute to a guy who was throwing bombs, and he, he became governor. So he's still trying to do that, and that seems to work sometimes, with, certainly with the base. I got a fundraising letter uh, that Trump sent out just yesterday, and he said, the attacks on me really are an attack on you, friend. Uh, they want power, and it's up to us to rip that power from their hands and put it back where it belongs. I need a million dollars in the next few days get a thousand percent impact for the next 30 minutes. I need your money. Don't give this to anybody else. This is just for you. This is the biggest bunch of blarney and rip off lies that you can imagine. And the idea says we have to rip it from their hands is really, I think, suggesting like he did earlier, that if he's arrested, if he's indicted, that there will be problems in this country like you've never seen. He's threatening another uh, insurrection. He's threatening civil war. And he's encouraging these people to be prepared to do it. He's a, he is a present and imminent danger to our nation. And Congressman, to your point about insurrectionists and threats, you introduced a bill to enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, 14th which Amendment. would prohibit those who have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against our United States from holding public office. Considering how many election deniers are on the ballot in this November's midterms, some of whom were actually at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, it seems like your bill is even more important now than ever, right? It is more important now than ever. It's unfortunate that we're not using it and trying to uh, implement it. Now, the crew uh, group um, did use it in New Mexico and got a, a candidate off the ballot. It's different than my bill, but there is the idea of the 14th Amendment was behind what they did. And the 14th Amendment was after the Civil War, and it punished treasonous individuals, people that didn't. Uh, support the United States and, in fact, attack the United States. And the difference, there's not that much difference. Uh, they haven't, they tried to overturn the processes of the Constitution and the free uh, transfer of power, fair transfer of power, and peaceful transfer of power of the presidency. Uh, this was the biggest threat to our democracy, uh, probably since the Civil War. And uh, with those people should not be allowed to hold office. We're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to take Confederate names and Confederate images 
off of American institutions, military bases, et cetera, and yet we're not engaged in trying to stop these people that did the act that the same uh, rebels and Confederacy did from holding office. And they're trying to get offices such as secretaries of state to where they control the electrical, electoral processes. This is a real threat to democracy and a real danger. Congressman, in the less than a minute I have left with you, though, I really want to quickly pivot to some news about Congressman Matt Gates. The Washington Post reporting yesterday, he apparently was seeking a pardon relating to the Justice Department's sex trafficking probe, of which he is a target. Should Matt Gates be continued to allow to sit with you as a colleague on the House Judiciary Committee? It's a bit uh, disturbing and a bit ironic that somebody under investigation would be overseeing the Justice Department. But the fact is, the Republicans make their, their choices, as we do when we're in the minority, uh, and we do as the majority, of who's going to be on certain committees, any committees. And uh, except for Marjorie Taylor Greene, who went really over the, way over the top and threatening Speaker Pelosi's life uh, and spreading a lot of QAnon theories, uh, nobody has been taken by House action off committees. She's the only person recently, and maybe ever. Uh, but... Something like that should be considered. I don't know why Speaker Pelosi hasn't considered it. Certainly, uh, the Republican leader wouldn't do it. He's, uh, you know, all of a sudden he's become a Trumper after he said how Trump at first was involved with January 6th and he changed his mind. Uh, they're out for power. They'll do anything to get power. And they want Matt Gates to be part of their team. So McCarthy doesn't want to punish Gates. And, and Speaker Pelosi, I guess, hasn't seen it to the point to where it's anything but a, a, a disturbing scene. It's not really anything that affects the Justice Department or does anything, because when you're the minority, there's not that much you can do except talk. And uh, it shows Matt Gates is seriously concerned about being convicted. He asked for a pardon. It seems like he did something that would be uh, an act, actions that would be criminal and that puts you in jeopardy of going to prison. So Matt Gates has basically admitted to what he did. And, and now it's just up to the Justice Department to, to prove it in court. And it's always great to be in, on your show with a lawyer who knows the law even better than her guests. <laughs> Congressman Steve Cohen, I will part at this moment with that wonderful compliment. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Katie. You're a star. Thank you, sir. And coming up, 30 years ago, one harmoniously diverse suburb in New Jersey was a model for the country until a fatal police shooting